Uh, let me introduce uh, John Jop Lapur. Uh, he is at Intuit. And also let me introduce um, Harish Jayakumar of Docker. They're here today to tell us about how to go from local to production. Uh, I'm told that there are some gems in this talk that we should be paying attention to, so uh, look out for those. Uh, but let's give it up for our speakers. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Harish Jayakumar. I'm a solutions engineer at Docker Inc. Uh, so as part of my role, uh, I help customers with two things. One is if they haven't yet started with Docker in their organization, I help them on like getting started with Docker. What is Docker? How to get started? How to move forward? And second, if they're already using Docker inside their organization, then we help them on moving to the next stage. That is taking Docker and using it in production. Orchestration, scaling, security, all the fun stuff. So we've been working with a lot of customers over the last few years. And one of them, which we're going to be talking about today, is how we were helping Yan Yap and his team at Intuit to use Docker and take it from local to production. So with that, I'd like to introduce Yan Yap, Senior Manager DevOps from Intuit. Thanks a lot, Harish. All right, everybody, 5 p.m., but uh, happy tax day. Um, it was Ben let the cat out of the bag in the, uh, in the, uh, the keynote uh, you know, in the morning, but uh, today's tax day. For those of you that are still surprised by that comment, you have a little under nine hours left to get your personal tax return to the IRS, and we'll be happy to help you with that with our products. So as Harish mentioned, my name is Jan Yap. I am with Intuit ProConnect, and we are in the tax and compliance business. So what does that really mean? We build products, and we run products for professional tax preparers. And so we have about 200,000 tax professionals that between January and today produce a little over, on average, 25 million tax returns. So you may be wondering, it's tax day, seems pretty important. Why is this guy here at 5 p.m. talking to us about Docker? And that is possible because this year is a little different than last year. Last year, I was pacing our war room, wondering about the things that I didn't know yet. So I know we did a bunch of performance testing, but did our performance environment match production? And if I did get into trouble, would I have enough time to respond using VMs? Would they come up quickly enough? Would I be able to get them? Would I be able to go? And so this year, I'm happy to say I'm not worried about those things. I still have some concerns, but I'm not worried about those things because our back end runs on Docker Enterprise. And so today, what Harish and I are going to do is share our nine-month journey to get from zero into production. And so we call them tax years, so we can run ta this particular tax year on a Docker backend. So we'll talk about the business case that we use to convince our leadership to take the jump with us. Then we will highlight this pilot project that we're talking about, which is essentially a pilot project in production. And then we will have to get real with you and deal with some of the problems that we actually dealt with and then the lessons that we learned. So before we get into the nine-month project, I have to take you guys on a little bit of a journey and step back in time because this did not happen overnight, even though that may seem that way. And it would be dishonest if I didn't say that Docker started for us because the developers brought it to me. I get to stand on this stage and look really cool and really smart, but it, this was literally a gift given to me by a developer that I was in a meeting with and I was pitching Chef to him and I was like, look at the Chef thing, it's drift control, it's awesome, it's gonna solve so many problems for us. And his response was, yeah, that's neat, but have you seen this Docker thing? And so that's where it started for us. So we discovered Docker right around December 2013. And then going, for, you know, going from there, we used Docker primarily for testing cookbooks and doing some local stuff. Uh, we didn't get really fancy with it until we went to DockerCon 2015, met a ton of cool people, maybe some of you here. And we learned from the community. Uh, but this was still a place where things had to be stitched together. And that was not something that I personally was comfortable with going forward with because that's hard to sell. That's hard to paint the picture for because now you have three products just to run this container thing. 
And so I think you know where I'm going with this. Docker 2016 was the swarm moment, right? Swarm is now part of engine. And when I propose a solution, I can use a single software stack from a single vendor. It, you know, I have to acknowledge the fact that this was not necessarily a positive moment for the entire community, but on the enterprise side, on my side, this was the moment where I could say, yes, I can go play with this and I can go build a case for this. And then Docker 112 finally came out of beta right around August, and that's when we got started on our project. So meet Ramesh, this is my boss. Um, I made him look angry, he's the nicest man on earth, and these people in the front row know that, which is why they're laughing. He's the, he's the coolest dude, but this is the look you might get when you try to pitch Docker to a leader um, at your company. And this also reminds me of my drive in from the airport, like you, uh, those of you that flew in, I had to take a cab, which I thought was strange in 2017, but I still did it, and the driver was like, hey man, where you going? And I'm like, DockerCon. And he's like, what's Docker? And I'm like, that is a great question. And I could not explain it to him. And so you will have that same problem I did with your executive and your cab drivers explaining what a Docker container is. But it's pretty easy to share what benefits Docker brings to the organization if you take it back to those developers. I mean, Solomon mentioned it in the keynote today, right? It's first developers. And so we believe that that's the foundational piece for the business case for Docker. So these are three some of our, our developers here, two of them are actually in the audience. And the first thing that we wanted to solve for was developer productivity. And once again, the keynote addressed quite a bit of this, but this is about removing that friction from the pipeline, right? removing friction from their, from their workflow. And the more you can do local versus in hosted environments, the faster you can go. And also those pesky coworkers, you're now isolated from them to a large degree. You can do so much more local, which also we believe leads to higher quality check-ins. The next thing people talk about, but it's mostly in demos, but this is something that we were really passionate about. Like most 34 plus year old companies, we own data centers. And we also want to go to public cloud, but it's super expensive for us to maintain materials for two types of hosting. But we believe Docker can help us here by producing a single artifact that we can then use on our own on-prem and also use in any cloud provider really, in our case AWS. And then the third case that we're solving for is a little more unique and we call it patching as code. And when you're at our scale, and you're, you're, in the, you're in the fintech industry, patching and security becomes super important. But at our scale, it's super expensive to patch. We have large teams that spend most of their time patching. Now what if we could use containers to patch our OS and patch our application and web service and databases using the same pipeline as we deploy features, as we deploy config changes? So patching as code. So Ramesh, that's the friendly Ramesh. That's the one we all know. Um, so yeah, cool, go prove it, but start small. And solve for containers only in our own data centers. And what he means by that is crawl, walk, run, which is a bit of a you know, corporate term uh, that we like to use. But what he's really telling me is solve that for containers. Prove that you can run our applications in containers. Don't go rewire the whole data center. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We have a good thing going. Prove to us that you can replace a VM with a container in our normal SDLC and don't get too crazy, start in our own data center and don't start in the public cloud. So step one for us, it was build the right team and we believe a mission based team. And so we build a small team with specialties in operations, development, performance and security. And so they're all here in the front row wearing their ProConnect shirts. So if you want to ask some tough questions, those are the folks you want to target. Um, and then we also look for partnership. And while the slide only mentions the vendor, it also is important that you partner with the owners of the products that you are dockerizing. If they're not on board, if they don't understand why you're doing it, you're going to have a much harder time. So actually, Dive, I brought one of my partners with me. And so he's been with me in the trenches with the engineers, and that partnership is super important. And then there is um, the partnership with a strong vendor and that's where Harish comes in, right? We knew there would be some bad days. 
this is a new technology on a new stack. And so the partnership with a strong vendor became super important. And then we have this concept of guardrails that we actually use for speed. It seems negative, but it's actually very positive. It's a bit of a contract between the mission-based team and the leadership. And it says, if you stay within these boundaries, you can do essentially what you need to do to get to our desired end state. And so in the hosting category, we wanted to make sure that we respected our current isolations. And so we did not want to write new rules just because Swarm likes to spread out. So stay in your boundaries and only run RHEL 7. And then to simplify matters but also to reduce the burden on getting security approvals and all sorts of audit requirements, we did not store any data in our containers or on their hosts. So data volumes were out. And then we limited overlay, no container to container <coughs> communication. We have strong F5 knowledge, strong F5 implementation, and so that was sufficient for our needs and we did not want to add another layer that we had to evaluate. And then this is about not rewiring the, the whole data center. Um, use your existing supporting technologies. Don't change out anything except the VM for the container. Switching it to applications only Java 8 stateless services. So if you look at a traditional stack, you got a web server, you got an app server, you got a database, you got MQ, you got a bunch of things that you can make really complex. And for local environment, those are really neat. But once you add those to your production end state for your pilot or your project or your first thing you're gonna do, it's gonna get super muddy and super complicated fast. And so we wanted to make sure that we would only do Java 8 pretty much because that's what we're good at. Our talent pool at Intuit, they are really good at writing Java services. And so those are the right kind of people to take us forward into containers. Only Tomcat servers, host OS RHEL 7, container OS RHEL 7. And then we wanted to make sure it was applied to the entire SDLC. So we went skinny on purpose so that we could get out of pre-production into production. So all those previous guardrails were about getting into production. Why was I so passionate about that? Because that's where you learn. If you do it in pre-production, there is no urgency, there is no, the pressure is much less and you just don't get the same learnings you do in production. Plus there's the risk of differences between pre-production and in production um, in pa as part of your SDLC. But more than anything, it's about learning the right lessons with the pressure on. So now we're getting off the MacBook, we have our team and I need to get off the MacBook. And it's important that at this point we realize it's no longer hello world. It's off the MacBook and there's new problems to solve. Problems such as how do I make sure my Docker hosts are all running the same correct image and how do I get traffic to my Docker container. And so that's where that partnership with a vendor came in and this is where we're going to switch into why Docker Enterprise solved that particular problem for us. Awesome. Thanks, Yanyap. So the solution that we recommended to Yanyap is Docker for Enterprise, right? So Docker for Enterprise is a suite of three components. First is the Enterprise Edition of Docker Engine. As you guys must have seen in the keynote, we talked, there's two different Docker engines. There's the Docker Commercial Engine and then there's the Docker Enterprise Edition, right? So Docker Enterprise Engine, from a functionality perspective, it's the same thing, but what we add to it is long-term support for the engine. Then it also comes with Docker Trusted Registry. So the Docker Trusted Registry is based off the open source V2 registry. So if you guys have used the Docker Hub, you're pretty familiar with it, think of this as an on-prem version of it. So when I say on-prem, it does not actually have to be specifically in your data center. So if you have a private cloud, you can still use it there as well. But what it adds on top of the open source V2 registry is things that enterprises care about, right? Security scanning. So every time you can push an image, a security scanning service can run in the background and make sure if there's any known vulnerabilities associated with that image. You can also do signing of images. So if you guys have heard of Notary, where you can use signing of images, that comes integrated with the trusted registry as Docker Content Trust, which allows you to sign images. So now you as an enterprise can ensure that only signed images are used inside my cluster. And then it comes with an orchestration layer 
called the universal control plane. So the universal control plane is based off the open source swarm that comes with the engine itself. But what we built on top of it, again, is enterprise level features, right? So there's a clean UI, single dashboard for you to know everything about your entire cluster. Active Directory, LDAP integration, making sure that only signed images can run on the cluster, all that. I'll be doing a demo of this at the end, so I'm going to save uh, most of the talking for that. And it is independent of the infrastructure, right? So you can actually run this on, all we care about is a node. So it could be on your private data center, or it could be on an Amazon cloud, Azure cloud, we don't care. And the other part is it's a completely pluggable solution, right? we realize you're not going to go and wipe out everything and start over from scratch. You probably already have some components existing in your organization. You're probably using Splunk for logging. For monitoring, you're probably using New Relic. You should be able to use Docker for Enterprise along with those components as you have them today inside your organization, right? So that is Docker Enterprise Edition, and you can get that from the Docker store. So let's take a look at what we Pro Connect did with this, right? So we're not going to do data volumes, so we can take that right off the board. And so we're left with those categories. And so there's an expo hall full of people, I think next door somewhere, um, that want to solve these categories for you. And we didn't change a single vendor to support our Docker project. So we stay with Red Hat for OS. CI say CI CD was still Jenkins. We stay with Tomcat, F5 for our networking, Chef for our uh, configuration management, and then the new Relic and Splunk implementations. And so the one thing that I do want to highlight the fact is that if you are already operating in the cloud or online, you likely have these technologies already in house. For you to experiment and try Docker in production, you need an orchestrator and you need service discovery. You can stick with your existing stack. Um, we don't have time to get into it, but I did want to highlight that you do need to solve monitoring and logging. You need to be really solid there if you want to go into production. So let's take a look at infrastructure. So we made an interesting choice, which you know is, is a side effect of owning your own data centers and having some choice in that regard. Oh, let me actually talk about um, Swarm first. Let's talk about the negative stuff first instead of positive stuff. Um, so I talked about us having to respect the isolation zones in our data centers. And Docker Enterprise and Swarm in general likes to have a one big swarm to rule it all. And that didn't work for us. So we ended up building four swarms which essentially is four copies of Docker Enterprise Edition. And that means that we had two for production, two for pre-production because we were running in two data centers. And the problem with that is that when you're at four, it's okay. You can manage with that. But also remember that we're only doing application service at this point. And so the multiplier on this is kind of scary. Once you do your, your public zone and your sensitive zone with this, even on your on-prem databases, it starts to multiply. You go into the public cloud with its many regions and availability zones, once again it amplifies. And so this is where that partnership comes in. And so even though it makes Harish uncomfortable, I will mention that we're pushing on Docker as a partner to make sure that a UCP of UCP or fleet management will become a reality in, in the future. Yeah, that feedback, and coming back to the partnership, right? So as and when we work with them, we hear these things, and that goes as feedback to our product teams. Uh, given that my product manager is right there, I am not going to commit or anything to it, but if you've taken the feedback and it could come. So I'll just leave it at that. And it's being recorded, so. <laughs> All right, let's go back to infrastructure. So we own our own data centers, and so I was able to run on bare metal, which is a unorthodox choice when you look at the majority of production implementations that are out there. And so why did we go with bare metal? Well, it was um, A, cheaper, and B, it was cheaper because we had less hosts to manage, patch, monitor, and license. And so less, in this case, is more. And so without boring you with our corporate accounting, we saved a substantial sum by going this route. And we also, as engineers, liked the fact that we had more control and we were closer to the bare metal to uh, experiment with. All right, so at this point of our journey, we have a team. We have software and we bought hardware. And so now the team had to get to work. And so it took them a single two week sprint to get the first service into production. 
And then we took another five sprints to get to nine. And so 10 weeks, or 12 weeks in this case, in, we had nine services in production. So we were feeling pretty good about ourselves. We were uh, pretty impressed with our capabilities and we were like, we are awesome at this. And we celebrated and we took team pictures and we wrote uh, you know, blog posts about ourselves and then we hit some rough seas. November and December of last year were rough and on a scale of one to five in rough, this was a large box of t-shirts and stickers from our account rep at Decker, Docker to limit the blows that we were taking and so that the developers would remain excited. It also highlighted the fact that a partnership was the right way to go. Harish and I got to be very familiar with each other, with each other through email and text and phone calls and video calls and it's the foundational piece for this particular session um, but at that time we did not have a good time. And so why do I, you know, it's naive to think you're not going to have problems but the type of problems we had were kind of surprising to us. Uh, it, you know, we had some quorum loss and we had some crashes and that, that, was, that was expected. But we had three major problems we're going to walk you through that were surprising to us and that came out of left field and that led to some real pains. First and foremost, on inbound connections, we suffered from stale ingress load bouncing. Big words, what does that mean? Well, when we did a deployment, and that would succeed, um, at times, the, one of the old down containers would stay in the load bouncer. And that is problematic because you get 200s across, and then all of a sudden the 404 pops out. And so, that is a huge problem. That was a huge problem for us. And also, there was no easy way to list pool members of the ingress load bouncer. So it was, it was this box that you couldn't see, but you knew something was wrong inside. Yep. And that's the feedback we'd received. And with that, in 113, what we've added is the concept of health check with containers, right? So obviously, in Docker 112, we introduced the built in load balancer using IPVS from the Linux kernel. Uh, but what it was doing was it wasn't actually checking so you would have timeout. So if you have like 10 containers that are running, it would just start sending the request to them. A stale container could still be receiving the request causing timeouts. So the way we fixed it in 113 was the concept of health check. So now before like, the request goes through the containers, it, it checks and then it sends the request to them. So we were pretty proud of our bare metal choice and we, we felt pretty good about it, having our own data centers and being able to do that. Um, and this is an exciting picture right here. I mean, you see a big box and then you have this bin packing thing you can do and like let's stuff that baby full of containers and, and run it to the max. And that worked great. Let's throw up some firewalls around it just to be safe. And that worked great with minimal traffic in the September, October timeframe. But then when November, December comes around, accountants are starting to prepare for, to do your taxes and they start building some traffic which means we get a lot more inbound traffic which is where we had the original issue with timeouts. That's solved but when your container takes a request it has to go do something, right? It's a service so it has to go make calls back out and we mentioned that we're talking, you know, there's no container to container. We go back out to our routing for every call. And as our routing started to increase and as our connections, outbound connections started to increase, we ran into intermittent connection resets and this baffled us. And it actually turned out that ephemeral port exhaustion on a bare metal is a real problem. Why is that a real problem? Well, VMs kind of made us lazy and we had forgotten the fact that a container is not a VM. And so if you run on a bare metal with many containers, all those containers share your TCP IP stack. And so us being systems engineers first and foremost, we decided to attack this problem with tuning. So a bunch of reuse settings. I'm sure you've been to Madhu's session. Uh, if not, you should, you should have gone um, or still go. I'm not sure when it is. But he helped us with a bunch of settings and C advisor and we got really deep into uh, networking. And What's funny about that, what we didn't anticipate is that once you start chopping up or chopping off active connections on the host, you're not telling the firewall that you did that operation. And so the firewall saw an IP in a port and was like, I already got this one. I mean, I can't take another request for the same uh, data. And so the firewall got confused and would start rejecting us. And so there's two 
solutions from a systems engineering pro from a systems engineering point of view to this problem, both of them are band-aids, but what we could have done and should have done was add more IPs to the bare metal using virtual interfaces and add those into the bonded NIC that Docker was associated with. Or we could have gone with Mac VLAN, which is relatively new to the Docker landscape, but it would have essentially given a TCP IP stack to each container at the cost of a full IP per container. But those are still band-aids. The real problem was that our applications were way too chatty. And when you're um, looking at your apps and, and you're in your own data center, it's not a very volatile environment. And we, um, we didn't tune our applications properly when it came to making connection calls and we didn't have socket timeout set properly. We didn't have uh, checked on stale uh, connections in our connection pools. And we actually, in some cases, didn't even have retries. And so we had to go do work on our applications. The applications had to get used to a more volatile environment. Yes, they met the criteria of microservices, but we did not write them with a fault tolerant mindset. And so when you go to a presentation and somebody says, hey, I, I forklifted this legacy app into a container from a VM and it works awesome, that is probably a true statement. But once you start putting real traffic on the wire, that application may struggle like ours did. Third and last problem that we had was zombie containers. And that sounds more fun than it actually was. So what would happen is we would come in in the morning or be woken up at night and we would notice that certain containers would still take inbound requests but it just kind of ate the request. It never came back off the box. And we were able to correlate that to DNS going haywire on us inside the Docker container. Now why did that happen? Well, it's because we allowed automated OS patching to occur on our Docker hosts. And in particular, when you patch kernel packages on a live host, you're in for a world of hurt. Yep. And that's when we'd recommend it on using the concept of what is called as a swarm drain. So drains actually built into the Docker engine itself and it's rolled up in UCP, right? So what it does is basically drains the applications from that specific node, which you want to patch or, or whatever to it, and then you can take those applications, move it to another node. Then you can deprovision this node, go and, I don't know, add a, you know, patch your kernel, put more SSDs, put whatever you want, and then you can actually bring back the applications into it. So that's the recommendation we made. So if you're running your applications, uh, with Docker, just don't go update the kernel. So that's the lesson I would say. All right, so let's, let's look at our timeline, right? So Docker 1.13 came around in January and helped us stabilize our environment right in time for tax season. And I know you're, you're, you're probably sitting there going, pretty cool story, guys, but did you actually prove any of these business cases, even though you may be in production? And for that, let's go back to the, the three we laid out. And for time's sake, we, we can only look at one, and, and since we're up here doing this thing, we chose patching as code. And what I wanted to highlight here is because we have this pipeline, there's nothing stopping us from inserting OS and application patching as part of our normal code delivery pipeline. A user story is a user story. If it's patching, it's patching. If it's a feature, it's a feature. It should be able to be picked up in this particular pipeline, end up in a, a pot of gold at the end there. So here's the thing. Uh, we were going to show you the real deal. And, and, and Harish and I, we, we trust you guys. But the security folks are a lot smarter than us, and they were like, hey, guys, may, maybe not, not so much, right? Let's, let's dial this down a little bit. And so Harish was graciously, uh, he graciously enough uh, helped out, and he built a simulation that reflects our real implementation that we're going to share with you here before we wrap up. Right. Cool. So it's time for a live demo. I don't have a... Texan hat with me right now, but I did go to UT, so hook em horns. All right, so what we're going to do is uh, I do have videos for backup, so before that, 
This is basically the universal control plane, right? This is the solution that we were talking about. So as you can see, it's one single pane of glass for you to see the entire cluster. So it tells you all the nodes that are running into your cluster. Actually, might help. So all the services, all the containers that are there. So it tells you all these containers, the health, whether it's healthy, it's down. And now what we're also gonna talk about is three things, which is stacks, secrets, and signing, right? This is an exact stack from Intuit. And you can see all these have been redacted by the Intuit security team. We actually wanted to show you guys the real deal. So this is what they're using. So I'm simply gonna just walk through some of these things on why they're using this, right? Before that, what exactly is a stack, right? So think of stack as the logical application, right? So if you have a bunch of services that make up your application, that becomes your stack for that environment. So you can actually combine all of them. So this is coming back to the logic of infrastructure as code, right? So you put everything and anything that makes logical sense together for that environment as a stack. So for example, in Intuit's case, this is the stack they used. So there was the services, which is an application. They said, I want two instances of this. So once you deploy this, it's gonna spin up two instances of the stack, of these containers. You can actually limit the CPU, memory, et cetera, for that specific stack. And then what happens when it failed? So on failure, I wanted to be able to restart and I wanted to uh, you know, delay five seconds before it actually restarts it, right? Then you can also add the concept of constraints. So you can say things like, I don't want these containers to run on my manager nodes. I want them to only run on worker nodes. Or you could put labels on them and say that, okay, this is an SSD only node. I want my containers to be deployed only on this node, right? So using labels and constraints, you can actually use that as well. Then they're also using the concepts of secrets, right? So secrets, like what they had mentioned in the keynote, um, basically is before secrets was there, the only way you could use passwords or keys was using environment variables, so just throwing them in the Docker file. So secrets was introduced in 1.13.1 engine, which is a secure way for you to manage your passwords and keys, et cetera, right? As you can see, this is almost very similar to the uh, keynote speech that happened this morning. That's how fast we work. We took that compose file from the morning at nine o'clock, gave it to Intuit at 10, they deployed it at 11, and then they sent it to the security team and it came back to us at two o'clock redacted. So that's how fast we move. Now, going back to UCP, so you can see over here, but for the, what we can do though is we can simplify and use another compose file. All right? So, <laughs> so now it's actually going and it's deploying the stack in UCP. So if you go back here, click on stacks, we just deployed a new stack. So the same thing which we're using on your Mac, when you, was, you didn't have to make any changes at all, you could take the compose file as is and deploy it as a stack. And if you want, you can actually even come here and go to the deploy and simply throw that stack right over here and you can get it deployed. Now, since we have two more minutes, what I'm gonna be talking about next is scanning of images. So once somebody actually signs and sends an image to your cluster, to your DTR, you can see here, you see this? Basically, as soon as a push happened, it basically said, there's a signing service that ran in DTR, and it said that there's two critical and three major issues. You can click on that, go to components, and it tells you what the issue was in terms of the severity. You can actually click on the CVE right from there, and it'll also tell you what was the issue that was associated with it. So the way we fixed it was very, very simple, right? I simply went and I fixed it in the Docker file. So let me go there. And I've done all this. We just simply moved from 3.3 .3 to 3.5 where the fix happened, simply did a build and push it again to DTR. And then that ran and we had a clean image deployed over here.
That's this one. I would obviously not push it directly. It will go through a CI CD pipeline like what Yanyak was talked about. But if I was going to show you guys all that, then I'll be the guy standing between you and the block party. So do come to the booth after this or tomorrow. I'd be happy to go into detail on more to talk about this. All right, very cool. Um, demo's done. And so you stuff those, um, those commands into a Jenkins job and you can see how a pipeline comes to life, right? Um, and so real quick to finish up, what we wanted to talk about is the lessons that we learned. And the first and, for first and foremost lesson that I personally learned, um, and that's not even on this list, is starting small. And keep it simple. Those are super cliches, but if you want to get Docker into production and start learning, that's a super important uh, thing to adhere to. And also, when you get some early success, don't get carried away and start taking on more and more and more. Stay the course because there's trouble ahead like we had. Um, and then, you know, those partners, right? They are they're super important. They need to be in the trenches with you. You need a vendor, you need a team, and you need peers that want to be on this Docker journey with you. And then you need room for unexpected problems and mistakes. We had problems and we had some uh, project deadlines too that really were running into, uh, that we were starting to push on. And so if you have a project that's already behind schedule, that is not a good candidate to Dockerize. You need a little extra runway. And no matter how many things people are doing to make Docker more enterprise ready, you still need to be open to frequent change. This is still emerging, this is still fresh. It's only four years old. You can't expect it to behave like VM or ESX. And so change will happen and you need to be ready to keep up with it. And then last, lastly, you know, it being tax day, um, what we discovered is that yes, you can create millions of tax returns using Docker and have a successful year. So with that said, we'd be happy to take a few questions. Mic there. First off, guys, I kind of figured the presidential election probably took the drain the swamp example from you guys, so congratulations. <laughs> uh, question on, uh, from putting the, the uh, during your, when you were doing the project, who was the, you don't have to throw anybody under the bus, but who was the biggest de detractor? Mm. Well, they're not the in this room, guys? right? <laughs> they're not in this room, you should be okay. They're not in this room, but it is being recorded. Be it is being on YouTube. Um, I think it, this is very local to us, and it, it's not a bad guy, but it's those deadlines I'm talking about, right? If you, um, this is a grassroots thing, right? And so your priorities may run into top-down priorities, which in our case is get ready for taxes. Right? And so that's the biggest detractor. It's the pressure of time. And I think any industry will have that same problem. And so this is a grassroots thing. And so you're always selling to make sure it stays above the cut line on your board. <laughs> There's happy hour later. <laughs> Hi. Um, great talk. Uh, we are doing pretty much the same thing that you guys have done. Already we are at like, you know, point zero. What is it that's something that you did that you wish you did not do? Whether it, it's not technology question. I'm talking about people and processes. Yeah. Because technology kind of works out. It's the people and processes where you have to drag everybody in the journey, yeah. right? I think personally I could have done a better, I mean, I could have done a better job getting my leadership and my peers ready for what could have been the reality. I mean, it's similar to this, right? You're, you're, you're kind of selling this thing because it's, it's not well understood and so you're always emphasizing all its positive qualities and there were dark days. I mean, it's, I'm not, I mean, we, it, Christmas was, was a bad time. But yeah, but let's say you had a stable workload running on your legacy environment, right? Yep. Why wouldn't you choose load balancer technology to send some stuff to Docker and some, I mean, because you, you would have had the same code base across your environment, right? So when you had problems, you could just drain stop and move traffic. Right. 
on a stable environment. Yeah, we, so, so we made a conscious choice not to do just that because it, it's similar to having two clouds or two hosting environments, right? We ha would have to maintain, and we move pretty fast, and so it would have been more expensive for us to do that. Um, and, you know, we, we're, we have this thing called Be Bold as a, as a company value, yeah. and that's kind of an out for us, and so we wanted to be all in. And so we didn't do, you know, the, the most important systems that were, you know, doing all the e-filing of our, our tax returns to go a little, um, you know, into our ecosystem, but we did real services that mattered, and we did not want to give ourselves an out that as soon as we hit that first problem, we're like, oh, let's drain these Docker hosts <laughs> and let's go back to VM, right? That would have been too easy. Yep. And so that's something that we put on ourselves. Thank you. Hi, I think you, you guys have done an awesome job. Just wanted to have a couple of questions answered. One was, um, how did you guys deal with the auto scaling uh, stuff? I mean, I, I know you guys did a uh, uh, data center, so that that's definitely seems like a challenge. And the other question is, um, Swarm, uh, how effective is it with blue-green deployments? Mm, two great questions. Um, so let's talk about auto-scaling. So auto-scaling for us, there was no auto part of it, and so it was manual scaling if you, if you want to call it that. So we left enough capacity on our bare metal buy that we knew we could scale a reasonable amount. So we overbought. So essentially we bought ourselves that, that, that scale factor. And then we used our existing monitoring technologies and logging technologies. So Splunk with New Relic and Wavefront allowed us to be notified when a scaling operation had to occur. Um, what's kind of interesting about our business is there, there's not like a million accountants joining the movement at a given point in time. So we can predict our traffic pretty well. And so, because we've been doing this for a while too. So there's not a lot of surprises for us. We're not, we're not gonna go viral, right? So we can, we can plan for that pretty well. Now blue green, um, we don't rely on our orchestrator to handle that for us. That's essentially some, some constructs that we ourselves put on top. So we do blue green deployments and without going into two, we probably should have a side conversation, but we essentially have two uh, service definitions for production, ENV1, ENV2. We keep those in sync, and that's what we use for our blue-green. Hi, you talked about uh, the return on investment, uh, and the, the several, the three different areas that you measured. Did you actually measure it financially or just uh, in terms of intangible benefits? Yeah, that's a good one. So um, I get that question a lot and it's hard to answer. And that's primi primarily because the benefit is around developer productivity first and foremost. And we are definitely you know, incurring more costs at this point in time to run Docker containers than we did before. Um, and so I don't have a, a, a silver bullet and say, yes, this is how much money we're saving. We're not saving money budget-wise. I think we're, 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 we have two benefits that we are seeing that are harder to quantify. One is developer productivity, and the other one is developer engagement. And by that I mean top talent wants to work with containers, right? And so by offering them this particular technology in the workplace, they want to stay with us and come to us. And so hard to measure, not true metrics, but those are two benefits that we're seeing. Um, I found the, uh, the discussion about guardrails very inspiring because everything we've done so far, it's, we're kind of taking a very complicated, stateful legacy application and trying to cram it into container ship. So, you know, basically, we're going to try some of these ideas for sure. But, but now that you guys have done, like, you basically you took all the, the, the whole field of problems and made very uh, constrained start here and we're only going to do these things. So. For you guys, there must be some more complicated apps or stateful apps or, or data data containing applications. So mm -hmm. for you, you must have like what's next or, or will you be here next year with another success story? And I just want to see that kind of forward. Like you must have some kind of doing more than the, the very finely cut guard railed approach. Yeah, yeah, you're assuming we have a big plan, right? <laughs> uh, and we do. And so uh, we, have, we have a short and a long. And the short is finish 
the remaining services that we didn't get to, right? So November and December were bad months. We have more services that we wanted to Dockerize, and so we have a backlog that we need to clear. Um, we'll do that. And then we actually need to regroup and look at the next thing. And so was, application servers are very easy to justify in a Docker container, but web servers and database servers, even I am a little fuzzy on if that makes sense to run. Um, you know, when you have CDN available and we have pretty solid um, solutions for uh, distributed databases as well. And so I think wider adoption and um, more groups within Intuit adopting Docker is the way forward for us. Obviously, we're, we're a large business unit, but we're just a part of Intuit, right? And so the intent is for us to bring this technology to all of Intuit first and foremost. Um, it's not the most inspiring answer, I know. Um, and um, I'm sure Harish and I will come up with a next big bet that we can, we can start working say. on so yeah, we can make the stage again. I think that's, that's a good point, right? I mean, and, and that's exactly what uh, the, the, the highlight over this was the partnership that grew over this, right? When they were, cho when they were you know, choosing the application to every step of like, where do they want to throw it in, how do they want to create the Docker file, everything we were involved in it. And it was, it was actually a two-way communication both between the Docker team and the Intuit team across this, right? So a year and a half back, if you were to ask me and said, would you take a stateful application and throw it into you know, uh, Docker and use it, I would have probably hesitated. But now, no, right? Because you can still go do all those things. Because again, the ecosystem is becoming more stable. The ecos uh, ecosystem, they have more partners who are actually adding more value to this. So yes, we have other customers as well doing it. And hopefully, we should be here next year talking about a stateful application. We'll see. Yeah, <clears throat> just want to make sure I understood what I heard from you earlier. Did you say there are not any cost savings on computer compute resources? Well, there, there, there definitely could be. That wasn't a focus for us, right? So if you look at our business case, it was not save money, right? I'm sure we're never wasting money, but that wasn't the objective here. If we had gone that direction, I'm confident that we could have you know, squeezed and, and focused on that and we could have saved money, but that wasn't a driver for us. What level of uh, access do you allow developers in, um, I guess, in the production environment? And where did you draw that delineation between you know, development, staging, prod? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and, and you know, that's something that we probably have, uh, could have covered, now that I think about it. It's a great question, and that's a common question. And so if you remember, we have the four swarms today, two in production, two in pre-production. The two productions are locked down, right? That's a highly sensitive environment, and so only the operations team will have access to deploy there. Even though, even they can't log into containers, they can only log into UCP, which is the control plane. And then they also don't do any manual deployments the way you may see in some of these demos. It's all controlled through password or user access control Jenkins jobs, right? So we monitor using UCP UI, but we don't actually operate that way. We have a pipeline. Now, pre-production is a different story. Um, we do grant access to our developers to UCP to be able to view and, and interact with the containers through UCP. We also have a few power users, two of them are here in the front row, that we actually grant more extended permissions to so they can help us with the adoption. But in general, and I, I mentioned this, this in the, um, at the top, or not at the top, but when we talk about the stack, monitoring and logging, Right? It, it's a big challenge to get the developer off the container. Right? It's not, they all want to SSH in and tail stuff. That's something that we had to break. And we broke that by not putting an SSH daemon on our containers. You can't SSH in. It's not happening. And we don't necessarily grant them access to the Docker host, so they can't exec in either. And so the mindset shift is towards, you know, you need to work in the tooling that we provide, so New Relic, Wavefront, uh, Splunk, and um, that was one of the bigger challenges that we had, and I would expect any organization that's been running on VM for a long period of time will have that pain. Hi. Hello. Uh, did you notice or measure any tangible benefits in terms of, say, environment stability or day one defect, reduce uh, in day one defects or better pipeline? 
Um, I think we would have <laughs> if we hadn't run into these problems that we had in November, December. That was a really bad time. So I can't, I can't say that I hit the mark on that one, right? I did not give a, and, and the majority of problems to be fair were in pre-production where we had the rate of change, right? And so if you ask our developers that they have a, a great development experience and specifically in the pre-prod, I think they would say no because of the problems that we laid out here. Now, January onward, we've been rock solid. And I think they will agree with that they, they, they've seen a glimpse of the potential when it comes to stability. There's also this critical mass thing where, you know, we only, are, we are nine services and we have a very large ecosystem with lots of touch points. And so for us to say this, you know, Docker made us more stable, um, a lot more things need to onboard to Docker before I can stand on this stage and say, yes, go do that because we had this happen to us. Does that make sense? Hi. Um, related to physical servers, um, when, did you have any issues in terms of having, well, I don't know how many servers you have, so let's say 1,000 or 5,000 physical boxes, and you deploy software that might have a Docker container that's 500 megs, um, did you have any network saturation when a new application was deployed to all those 5,000 physical boxes? And how do you deal with that? So it, it's, you know, it's nine, nine services. It's not quite at that scale, right? <laughs> you, we got to dial that number down quite a bit. Um, and no, we didn't, we didn't have a, a bandwidth or a saturation problem. And I, I, I like to credit our, our image strategy to that, right? So if you remember, it's only Java 8 on Tomcat. And there's no... There's no differentiation between what images are being used. We use a single image, and the only difference is the war file that's embedded. That's the application layer. And so we only have that diff download. And so we have not seen, because of our image design and because of our guardrails, we have not seen a problem in that area. But I do think it, in, in, at, at real scale, it's a problem that needs to be researched. Excuse me. So, since it's live in production, have you noticed any performance differences between the old way and the new way? Well, you mean like application performance? Yes, yes, application. Yeah. Um, we haven't run the numbers yet. We usually do a retrospective, but we haven't encountered performance problems. So, we have these boundaries that we set that we alert on. Like, if we go beyond this TPS, or we, you know, it's it's that classic monitoring, and so. I don't have any numbers that I, that I can I can share with you, but the myth of that the myth that Docker imposes this penalty, we did not run into at all, right? And and where it gets interesting too, we moved from pretty saturated virtual machine servers hosts to dedicated bare metal with only nine services. So, I mean, we were moving pretty fast. So, that's probably not something that you can take home either. But we have not seen that penalty that people sometimes talk about. Okay, cool. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, when you've encountered issues like the poor, poor exhaustion that you explained, uh, did you ever think uh, of running Docker containers inside VMs? Yeah, we actually did consider that, yeah. We did, we did talk about that. That was actually one of the suggestions before we got to Mac VLAN. Okay. Um, and that was a consideration, but we had a... Uh, we had a real passion on the team not to go in that particular direction. But that could have been a fix as well. It just would have made our hosting environment so much more complicated. Okay, so basically you wanted to avoid the complexity. That's correct. That's okay. Yep, but it would have been a solution, yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Good job.